Qatar. Hello and welcome. As women join men in the street protests across the Arab world, how much are they falling victim to the usual stereotype reporting of gender issues in the Western media? Women have always played a part in shaping the region, but their role in society has often been misunderstood. Many Western commentators marveled at the recent sight of women protesters in Tunisia, Egypt and Li Libya, prompting critics to point out that these pundits were caught off guard by their own stereotype views. The typical portrayal is of passive Arab women, usually repressed by religious dogma, with no voice in society. But the reality is that women have been active political players in trade unions and grassroots organizations in the region for many decades. So today we ask, what role are Arab women playing in shaping the future of their countries? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email, and we also welcome your phone calls on the show. Well, we're joined by Rabab El Mahdi, Professor of Political Science at the American University in Cairo. Last year, she co-edited the prophetically entitled Egypt, the Moment of Change, which describes the growing internal pressures that the Mubarak regime faced over the last few years. It explores the role of Islam in society and the growing social movements for democratic change in Egypt. Joining me from Duke University is sociologist Dr. Francis Hasso, Associate Professor of Women's Studies and International Comparative Studies and author of Resistance, Repression and Gender Politics in Occupied Palestine and Jordan. Also with us is Professor Nadia Al-Ali, a social anthropologist and director of the Center for Gender Studies at the School of African and Oriental Studies at the University of London. Her book, Secularism, Gender and the State in the Middle East, explores the Egyptian women's movement. She's also written extensively about Iraqi women after the US-led invasion. I welcome you all to the show, and I will start with uh, Cairo, if I may, and uh, Professor Rabab uh, Al-Mahdi. Let me uh, start by asking about the way the Western media is turning its eyes on the Middle East with all the recent upheavals to watch the protest. And I know you've been asked a lot of questions which frustrate you immensely. Give me examples of the kind of things that, that you're getting that, sa that come across so naive. Uh, I mean, f uh, starting from the, the question of the role of women in the revolution, as opposed you'd never ask the question, the role of men in the revolution, right? Um, and then the, how do you think that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, coming out now to the political, political life uh, would end up uh, putting uh, women in a much more disadvantaged position than they already are? Um, and lastly, the, the question or the pleasant surprise when uh, people came to Tahrir, when journalists came to Tahrir and they're like, oh, so, the, so there are uh, women and there are veiled women who go out protesting. Um, and they're, they're frustrating and sometimes those questions are um, absolutely insulting. In so th then give me an idea of what you feel the real picture in Egypt is when it comes to the uh, current situation for women there. Uh, I think when we when we look at this uh, uprising or revolution, whatever you're going to call it, we need to address uh, the fact that women have participated just as men have participated. They have not participated based on a gender-based uh, agenda. They've participated on common themes to do with democratization, to do with uh, a change in economic policies against neoliberalism, against torture, against common themes that they, as women, chose to put forward as their priority. They believe, and that's their agency, and that's their right. If we're talking about women agency, we should respect the fact that they would choose at specific moments of history to mobilize on things other than their gender specifically, but how those broader themes of democracy, of new liberalism, have actually had different, implement, uh, different uh, implications for them as women. Well, and I think if we're sincere about um, okay. being feminists of a sort, we have to respect that choice. Well, let me bring in Dr. Francis Hasso here and welcome you in and, and ask you, I mean, you know, there is really obviously reality in reality, a lot of room for improvement, a lot of room for improvement for the lives of women in the Middle East. Now, I wonder what real change you think these uprisings will bring? Well, I think, I think we need to remember that um, even that category of women in the Middle East is very broad. And, and mm -hmm. as Rabab mentioned, um, uh, for example, neoliberalism has had a very negative impact on both 
men and women, and if you think about peasant women, uh, working class women, women in living in rural areas, they're going to want different things than women who are maybe highly educated and urban. And I do think, however, that we need to keep in mind that, um, that the economic issues, the question of imperialism, the question of neoliberalism, can't really be disconnected from the issues of gender, and they'll work themselves out in really different ways for different kinds of women. I mean, as I think about uh, these revolutions, which are very exciting, um, I also know that many revolutions work out in a way that really uh, leaves some people behind, right. leaves some women behind, leaves many men behind. Then and we would want to make sure. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, Rick. then let me ask you then, uh, Dr. Fr uh, Dr. Hasso, uh, how, in terms of the protests in Tunisia and Egypt, for example, where they've, r they've run that much longer, how um, inclusive are those calls for change? Is it just about taking down the regime, or do you see some genuine desire for change across all aspects of, uh, of society, where, w whether it's issues or economics, uh, sorry, issues of gender or economics? Yes, I actually see an emergent kind of politics on the streets in Tunisia, in, um, in Egypt, and in other places. And I think people are, uh, the calls for dignity, for freedom, for social justice, as soon as you make those kinds of calls, <coughs> you have to think, well, freedom for who, social ju justice for who, dignity for who. And I think people are cognizant, maybe more than at any other time, that if you're going to make those kinds of calls, then you're going to have to include everybody. I also think you have to be careful because they could be defined in a very restrictive way that actually does d uh, exclude people. And we know that women, and again generalizing for a minute, that women have been excluded actually by secular, uh, communist, uh, and, and Islamist political movements in various ways. I mean, even within those movements, they've struggled um, in various ways to be sure that they're their voices and that their their desires are, okay. are included. Well, let me let me bring in uh, Professor Nadia Al Ali here, and good to have you with us as well. And and I know l you like uh, uh, Rabab Al Mahdi have also faced a lot of uh, you know questions that you consider a bit naive or, or, or sort of misdirected. Uh, and I know you wrote a lot about women in Iraq after the U.S. led invasion. Uh, you right. ask, you get asked questions like, "What do Iraqi women want?" Well, how do you tend to respond to those kind of questions? What do American women want? What do British women want? Um, you know, people rarely ask those questions. And I think the moment I ask it back, they realize, well, you know, we are not a homogeneous body. You know, we are different women with different ideas. And, um, you know, th over the last few years, I've always been asked. And I, I told them, well, you know, there are different Iraqi women with different experiences, different political views. Uh, and it's not just because of sectarian differences, that, but it's because of class differences, it's because people live in different places around Iraq. Uh, but I want to come back to the point that <coughs> Francis actually raised. Um, I think um, this category of the Middle Eastern woman, I think, is really problematic. I mean, there are so huge differences also from one country to another, and uh, the kind of issues that Egyptian men and women are facing are quite different from um, the issues that uh, are emerging in Tunisia. Right. And Iraq is yet another issue. I mean, Iraq is a situation where um, actually women's rights are supposed to come from outside. And I think it's a good example of the fact that, if anything, if there is an attempt to bring democracy, human rights, and democracy in from outside, what we actually see is a backlash. Okay. Um, lots of people don't realize that the situation of women in many ways, I mean, I don't, want in, I don't want to be apologetic or glorifying the previous regime. It was a terrible dictatorship. But when it comes to women, actually, okay. uh, they had many more rights in terms of education, labor force participation, I want so to. I want on. to. Uh, but I also want to come, Professor yeah. Ali. I want to get onto that in a second. But let me yes. just touch on one thing. With watching what's been going on with yes. Tunisia, Egypt, and to some degree with Libya too. Let me ask you what generational differences are, are emerging when it comes to women. You know, we're, we're seeing women out in force. We're seeing women and learning more about what's going on there. The societies, through the lens of the international media, uh, have been opened up a lot more. What generational differences are evident? Well, I mean, uh, there are differences in terms of the tools of protest, but 
uh, you take example, uh, you take Egypt as an example, and uh, Rabab will know this much better than I do. But I've studied the history of uh, the Egyptian women's movement. And actually, Egypt has, uh, since the turn of the 20th century, Egyptian women were really at the forefront in the region um, to try to advocate women's rights. So there are lots of generations. I mean, there are women when I. Uh, did my uh, wrote my book about the women's movement. I interviewed women in their 80s who had been for decades working for it. So it's yeah. not that all of a sudden you have you know young women who are interested in it. But um, also in terms of democracy, I mean there's a long, long actually um, history right. of women being involved in wider political movements, whether okay. it's with respect to the mm -hmm. student protests in the 70s or, you know, the anti-colonial uh, uh, struggle in at the turn of the 20th century. I want but what has professor? changed is really, I think, the tools. Yeah. Okay, Professor. In sorry, because because uh, I want to get I want to make know, sure now, uh, young women. Yeah, no, I understand yeah. what you're saying. I, I want to I want to make sure I get uh, you know all three of you get your views in as I as I progress this uh, this discussion. One thing, let me ask uh, Professor Ahmadi uh, to answer an email we got from uh, one of our viewers because we try to get viewer questions here, and and Sarah has written in saying. Yeah. It is my greatest fear that once the dictators leave, women will again be forgotten. Not a single woman was on the board yeah. of experts drafting the new Egyptian constitution. Professor Ahmadi, what's your view on that kind of comment? Yes. Uh, there are a number of things. I mean, women were not uh, uh, participating enough under dictatorships, uh, let alone, I don't think women are participating uh, enough in established democracies. In the U.S., it was a big thing for Hillary Clinton just to run for presidency, you know, and, and it was the first time. So I think, uh, as a feminist, I think women are uh, at a disadvantage everywhere, and the Arab world in Egypt is, um, is not an exception. I'm worried about um, not only the position of the, um, the Constitutional Committee. I'm worried about other rights, uh, uh, economic rights, political rights, uh, so on and so forth, that those women have been struggling for for years in factories, in farms, in villages, so on and so forth. But I think um, the kind of mobilization that led to those uh, democratic uh, changes that we're seeing uh, will be channeled for other demands. So we'll, we'll see a continuation of uh, workers demanding their rights as okay. much as we're going to see uh, a mobilization of uh, students demanding freedom uh, of universities, so on and so right. forth. And now women are an integral part in all those groups. And it's interesting you raise that because, Dr. Hassel, I want to touch with you on, on an issue that I've certainly come across when I've traveled across the Middle East. People make it very clear that when you have uh, women students, they tend to make often more of, a, uh, more of that educational opportunity. They tend to be better students, and there are areas where you know women uh, stay longer in the educational system as well. And I wonder to what degree uh, that's being reflected or has been reflected in policies throughout the Middle East in trying to get that crucial element of the potential workforce, uh, uh, that student base, expanded. Yeah, I mean, I think that we need to uh, be careful so that we're, you know, we're both celebrating these revolutions and recognizing that they're ongoing. I think that we, you know, I think women, young women, educated, not educated, they're not being included to the degree that they should be. I also think that young people more generally actually do have some concerns that differ from the older generations in certain ways. Actually, a lot of them have to do with marriage, with the ability to afford to buy a house, with marriage laws, with gender relations and gender ideologies. I think some, some things are shifting, and I think we need to sort of balance this kind of um, celebration of these revolutions with this active work on all levels mm -hmm. because different women will want different sorts of things. I think it does matter if there are only men at the table. I think it does matter if actually there are only better off men at the table. I think it does. We do need to ask who is excluded and who's included. I wouldn't want only certain women to right. be included. I would want the range of possibilities. Okay. So so those are some of the, the concerns that I would raise. Well, let, let's get a couple of callers on. We've got Betty in the UK. Betty, thanks for joining us. What would you like to ask? Um, um, my question and um, um, my appeal is really um, about Ethiopia. I am a, a Ethiopian origin okay. from UK. And um, it is a very, very sad um, uh, situation. Um, all other um, uh, areas um, has been um, uh, covered um, uh, um, in the world 
um, uh, who are living under the worst um, uh, Betty? brutal Betty, let me, I, I see what you're getting at, that you know, that Ethiopia in this case perhaps has been excluded or the situation is worse. Let me ask Professor uh, Nadia Al-Ali, um, you know, from the uh, School of African and Oriental Studies at University of London to address this issue, that perhaps is there a chance what's being seen happening in the Middle East? Um, you know, th we've seen the domino effect in the Middle East uh, with, with the, the, the uprisings. Can you see this going further? Can you see this inspiring uh, greater change anywhere else? And Ethiopia is an example here in the case of Betty. Well, I mean, I'm sitting here in London and I feel hugely inspired. As you might know, we are going through lots of changes here with the conservative government, student cuts. And I think many of us actually do feel that um, there is a possibility of proper democracy because here, even you know, in, in the West, uh, we have democracy where you know, we go out to vote and then we have a, a government that um, is taking decisions for us, um, I mean, during the just before the invasion of Iraq. I mean, millions of people went on the street to demonstrate against it, but still the government went ahead. And I think many of us around the world feel inspired by this. But at the same time, I also don't want to be naive, and I share sort of uh, Francis' concerns. I mean, um, you know, these are processes, the hard bits are starting. I mean, I'm also, I'm so happy for what's been happening in <coughs> Tunis and Egypt, but we also see now, of course, counter-revolutionary movements and um, the hard work is still right. beginning. Let me but yes, I mean, I uh, very share uh, the caller's uh, frustration. I can understand where she is coming from. Okay. I mean, I think there are lots of struggles around the world that are not being covered, especially, of course, in Africa. Okay, well, let me get a caller in from Pennsylvania. Mike, thanks for your patience. What would you like to ask? Uh, I just wanted to, to generalize the discussion a bit. Um, okay. Essential to democracy, of course, is freedom. And a corollary of that, obviously, is women's rights. But eventually, um, it's just a question of when, you have to also face the question about homosexuality, that is to say, gender roles and a freedom from a society's demand that they be fulfilled in certain specific ways. So I think homosexuality eventually is going to have to be tackled, and I'd like your... Uh, discuss and to comment on yeah. this, uh, specifically in Egypt, actually. Well, actually, so I was going to put this to Professor Mahdi and ask, you know, these, these kind of issues. Now, of course, that's a very sensitive topic for the Arab world. W at what point do you see discussions opening up on these kind of issues where they can be considered less taboo and less uh, difficult to discuss openly? I think the important is thing for to me? Do is not to project one society's priorities uh, at a historical moment and to project those priorities on other societies. Um, in the U.S., homosexuality became a societal uh, issue at a certain point of time in history. Um, and maybe or maybe not, uh, this would be an issue uh, with which society would like to societies would like to mobilize um, on in Egypt or Syria or, um, or other places. Uh, but I think the important thing here is to respect the timing and to respect yeah. choices of people. Um, you know, five years ago, no one thought that Arabs could mobilize uh, that intensely on a democracy. We talked about Arab exceptionalism. Right. Um, and you never know. But I think, again, it's very important not to make analogies, um, not to take issues and uh, ready-made agendas, whether for women's rights, uh, homosexuality or whatever it is and try uh, to shift it, try to import it to other contexts right. at, at a different historical well, well, Let me get a question to Dr. Uh, Dr. Hasso and uh, just ask a question that came in from a viewer by the name of J.C. Kirby because this issue of religion comes up when it comes to these kind of topics and uh, J.C. Kirby wrote in saying religion is the root of gender inequality. It should be seen for the man-made construct it is and done away with. And I, I presume that's going to be a very rare sentiment uh, in the Middle East itself. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a very problematic way to think about religious belief and religious identity. I started by saying that women and men, boys and girls, are going to want different things. People live their religious identities in very different ways. So I don't definitely, uh, you know, wouldn't want to, you know, just picking up on what Rabab said, wouldn't want to be projecting actually a very individual kind of approach to thinking about religion. If we think about the United States, actually most people are very religious. I want to pick up, though, on the question of sexuality because um, 
because we know that many conservative, including restrictive governments, have sort of manipulated these ideas of uh, cultural and moral uh, disintegration, foreign invasion, to actually sustain their th to sustain their governments. It's it's one of those issues that's very con convenient, has been very convenient for repressive governments to manipulate and negotiate with other forces. So, uh, you know, I see a whole range of possibilities, but I agree with Rabab that we shouldn't be, we should allow people to do what they're doing, which is they're struggling, they're articulating, they're coming up with new possibilities. I think they're pushing for an expansive notion of dignity. And <coughs> when you do that, a lot of things uh, do, you know, a lot of things are included. Uh, but she's right that we shouldn't want it to look the way it looks, you know, um, in New York City in the 1960s or something. Okay, Professor Nadia Lali, let me ask you about the sort of the prospects of uh, a greater entrepreneurial spirit being expressed for women in the Middle East. We've seen in parts of Africa, for example, that entrepreneurship has actually allowed uh, women to, to get a stronger place in the workforce and, and take more control of their lives. Do you see in, in this new changing landscape of the Middle East that perhaps women can, can play a greater role as entrepreneurs and perhaps improve their position that way? Yes, but I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, when we see um, developments, economic developments in a country like Iraq, there's lots of push for a neoliberal capitalist push for women and men to uh, become entrepreneurs. Uh, this is at the expense of um, you know, women being involved in the public sector and historically in the region, women have been much more involved in the public sector. This is at the expense of welfare provisions of the state. Um, so I think it's a very sort of narrow angle to look at it, women entrepreneurs. Yes, of course it is nice and we have it in the Gulf, but I don't think it really uh, addresses the wider issues of socioeconomic rights and I'm very concerned about this neoliberal agenda of, you know, let's yeah. train some women to become entrepreneurs. And actually we saw that in Iraq, there were lots of training programs uh, funded by the American government to try to train Iraqi women, you know, to become entrepreneurs. And um, I think this okay. is very problematic. Let's get in uh, a quick call. Mohammed in Minnesota in the USA. Go ahead, please. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm asking the professors, uh, do they want uh, the Arab women to behave like uh, Western women in terms of homosexuality? Uh, okay, and well, and Homosexuality and also, also the covering of the, the, the hijab. Okay. Uh, they, w they, w they want to behave like a Western. Let me, let me, uh, Mohammed, let me put that question, interesting question. Let me put it to uh, Professor uh, uh, Rabab al-Mahdi. Um, let's get your perspective on that. Uh, do you see that there is, there is a parallel to be had? I mean, Mohammed's question is fairly direct. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of women or Egyptian women. I can speak uh, on behalf of myself saying, of course, I want women to behave the way they see fit. And I want them to be entitled to their own bodies, whether they cover the, uh, those bodies, whether they don't cover them, what kind of dress code they choose, what kind of sexual orientation they choose. Of course, absolutely. I want them to be free to make such choices. And thought. I don't think those uh, uh, choices should be divided on binaries of West, East. All right. A quick thought, thought Professor Al-Mahdi. Uh, just, just literally 30 seconds. Has the Western media let down the image of Arab women with its coverage? Just a quick thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have no doubt uh, about it. The, the, uh, the women featured um, on Time, uh, the cover of Time magazine as Egyptian women, as, you know, uh, are three of them are my students from okay. the American University uh, in Cairo. Is this representative of Egyptian women? Okay. Uh, the Professor? Western media is obsessed with people who look like people in the West, All not right. Egyptian women Professor? in factories, I, in, uh, in villages. I unfortunately have to stop you there, and thank you oh, all three for being with us. Women. I'm so sorry to, to stop you because we're out of time, but thank you all for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Remember, you can watch a podcast of the show on iTunes. Today, we feature our conversation with world-renowned singer Yusuf Islam, famous for his rock ballads in the 1970s. On the next show, rape as a weapon of war. As women continue to be exposed to extreme sexual violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we speak with world-renowned feminist and activist Eve Ensler about her project to help the victims of rape crimes there. Be sure to tune in for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.